right. Well, thank you very much from our Fort Atkinson offices here in Wisconsin. This is Lucas Schostrom. I'm an associate editor with Hordes Dairyman. Steve Larson, our uh, normal host from the Hordes Dairyman side, is on the road today en route to a conference. Of course, uh, I want to welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, today we are going to hear from Jeff Smith from North Carolina State University. And uh, Mike Hutchins also will be hosting this webinar with us. And uh, the topic today is responsible antibiotic use. And I think we'll all I'll look forward to this. And we thank Marielle and their Best of Class Dairies program for the sponsorship. Uh, with that, uh, unless there's some ribbing from Mike to come forth, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Mike and we'll go from there. Thank you. Well very good, Lucas. Great to have you on board and part of the team as usual. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Smith. You see that handsome devil there. In case you're confused, he's the one on the left as far as that goes. Uh, Jeff received his BS degree at Clemson University and then uh, saw the light and came to the University of Illinois, received his MS in toxicology and his DVM in, in 1998 as far as that goes. He then spent uh, some more time at Illinois completing an internship in ruminant internal medicine and in 2002, Dr. Smith uh, joined the faculty at North Carolina State University, where he's currently Associate Professor of Ruminant Medicine in the Department of Population, Health, and Pathobiology, as far as that goes. So we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Smith join us today to talk what we think is a tremendously critical topic that's facing the, the dairy industry. So, uh, Jeff, we won't take any more time from, your, from your, uh, your schedule and turn the program over to Dr. Jeff Smith. Okay, thanks Mike and Lucas for the introduction. Uh, as Dr. Hutchins said, we're going to talk about responsible antibiotic use on dairy farms. Uh, this is a picture of where I work. This is the back of North Carolina State University. Um, so this is a little bit different format for me. Usually I'm talking to groups of people. I can see you, you can see me, we can interact. So I thought I'd start, take one slide before we get into the presentation and just talk a little bit about what I do. Uh, so I am a veterinarian. I work at North Carolina State University. About a third to a half my time is spent doing veterinary work. So we have a university referral hospital. I work in the hospital uh, every fourth week. So last week I spent my whole week in the hospital. I also do dairy field service where we go out to farms. I do a lot of calf herd health work, a lot of fresh cow herd health work. Uh, and then I do a little bit of teaching and research. My research interests primarily involves calf health and also drug use on dairy cattle. Uh, I'm part of a group called FARAD, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end of the webinar. That stands for Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank. Uh, so we are a resource for your veterinarian uh, to get extra label drug use withdrawal times. So we also do a lot of research um, to come up with some of that data. Right now we're doing a lot of work on banamine and dairy. Um, that is sort of the residue that the FDA is most worried about right now is, is flunix and urbanamine concentrations in cull cows, also in milk. So we're doing a lot of work trying to figure out why uh, those residues seem to be happening right now. But I'll talk more about ferret towards the end of this presentation. So that's what I do. Uh, this is me uh, with a group of Dr. Hutchins' favorite Jersey animals. So the goals of the webinar, what I hope we learn today, uh, we're going to review the importance of responsible drug use on dairy farms. Why is this an important topic? Hopefully we'll understand how to use antibiotics both legally and effectively. Make sure that when we use them, the animals are responding to treatment. Make sure you understand as producers how to avoid residue problems both in meat and in milk. And at the end of the webinar, we want to just say a little bit about the current residue testing process in the United States to give you an idea how that works and what's happening. Okay, the importance of responsible antibiotic use on farms. The reasons why this webinar I think is important. Obviously, the most important one that everybody realizes is we want to avoid residue violations. This is a significant economic loss for the producers. We want to make sure we don't have a residue in the milk tank. We also don't want to have a residue in cull cows. But there's bigger reasons or there's reasons other than that why I think the responsible use of antibiotics on farms is important. Uh, we certainly want to maximize the likelihood cows are going to respond to the treatments, uh, diseases they're being treated for. If I'm treating a cow for mastitis or metritis, I want to make sure uh, that she gets better. I certainly am not here to discourage anyone from using antibiotics on their farm. I think we need to use antibiotics in the dairy industry. I think there's a lot of uh, diseases that dairy cattle uh, 
get sick because of that I can effectively treat with antibiotics. I realize there's organic theories that don't use antibiotics. Uh, that's probably a debate for another day, uh, but I'm not here to dissuade anyone from using antibiotics. I just think we can uh, do it in a responsible manner. Another reason we want to, this is an important topic, is we certainly want to minimize the development of antimicrobial resistance. That really occurs when we start using large or mass treatments of antibiotics sort of indiscriminately or not in a responsible manner. Uh, when we do that, that's when we really see uh, resistant antimicrobials emerging and then our drugs that we use stop working. And lastly, just ensure that cattle are healthy and productive. Again, I've already mentioned I think antibiotics are necessary in the dairy industry. I think they're important. We just need to learn to use them in a responsible manner. Okay, so here's our first poll question. Uh, what is the most common reason you use antibiotics on your dairy farm? So there's five choices there. Mastitis, respiratory disease or pneumonia, lameness, any type of lameness, calf diarrhea, or reproductive diseases. I had a choice that said other, other which I had to take out because the poll is only going to allow us five choices. So if there's a possibility you could have uh, something other than one of those five. But choose one of those five and we'll see. I'll show you in a minute what the data from, from the across the United States says on that. So I'll give a, a couple minutes for everybody to vote. Oh, no, we okay. only give them 45 seconds. 45 Republicans seconds. Are, Republicans really got to pull the trigger here. None of this stuff like in D.C., I'll tell you, okay. Jeff. So, they got to pull the trigger pretty pretty fast. As okay, as so I see everybody can see that. We'll keep going, and then I'll show you. looks like your data is sort of going along with what the rest of the data in the U.S. says. So antibiotic use on dairy farms. I've just got a couple slides here that says, in a nutshell, antibiotic use on dairy farms is very common. Uh, this is a survey um, from four big dairy states, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, and Wisconsin, that was done about six years ago. Uh, in this survey, almost 90% of dairy producers said in the previous 60 days they had treated between 1 and 10% of the cows in their lactating herd with antibiotics. 10% of those farms had treated between 11 and 25% of their cows, so in a two-month period. So certainly lots of antibiotics get used on dairy farms. In this survey, Ceftifur, which is XNL or Exceed or Naxel, was the most commonly administered antibiotic. Um, there was a follow-up survey in Wisconsin where we saw a very similar antibiotic usage rate. Um, somewhere between 1 in 10 cows every month or so received antibiotics. Again, in this study, Ceftifur was the most commonly used systemic antibiotic, which means injectable antibiotic. Uh, in this study, they had today pursue an amoxy mass where the most commonly used intramammary antibiotics. Uh, this was before spectrum mass was on the market. Diseases most often treated with antibiotics in this survey were mastitis, foot infections, uterine infection or metritis, and respiratory disease. Okay. Another more recent survey, 381 dairy farms in Washington State. Most common reasons for antibiotic use were mastitis, calf diarrhea, and lameness. You see the drugs there are listed most commonly used. Cephalopyrin is today, that's an intramammary antibiotic. Ceftifur, we've mentioned, is an injectable antibiotic. Penicillin and oxytetracycline. In this survey, 23% of producers used drugs that were not approved for dairy cattle, and we'll talk about what some of those drugs are as we go through. There was also some reports of prohibited drugs, and we'll talk about what those are. 16% of farms still use genomycin in this survey. Again, this is a fairly recent survey. Genomycin is important because it has a very, very long withdrawal time and is very likely to result in residues. So it's not a prohibited drug, but it's drug that we're trying to move away from in the cattle industry. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail towards the end. Uh, another survey from Pennsylvania reported about 80% of farms used extra-label drugs. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means here in a little bit. So, again, drug use in the dairy industry is very common. Uh, and we also see from surveys that use of extra-label drugs or drugs that are not specifically approved for dairy cattle is pretty common as well. So this is data that basically answers the poll question from today. This is our, the first poll question we had. This is data from both the 2002 and 2007 National Animal Health Monitoring Survey. These are the big dairy studies that the USDA does. 
So these first two columns are asking what is the percentage of cows in your herd that were treated with antibiotics for the following diseases during the previous year. Just as your poll, 83% of you said mastitis was the most common uh, disease you use antibiotics for, which is in line with the poll results. Uh, between 15, 16, 17% of cows uh, in most dairy herds are treated for mastitis in a, in a given year. In this, uh, in this survey, lameness is number two mostly foot rot and hairy heel warts. Uh, you can see reproductive diseases is really the only disease where we saw a significant increase between 2002 and 2007 going from five to seven and a half percent of cows. Um, pneumonia and then lastly diarrhea or gastrointestinal disease with about two percent of cows in the herd being treated. The column on the right just says the percent of farms that treated cows is so 85% of dairy farms in this survey treated at least one cow for mastitis. The other 15% of farms probably were either lying or should have been using uh, drugs for mastitis. I think certainly most all dairies would say they need to treat at least one cow every year for mastitis. So this just shows sort of along with our survey results what we're most commonly using antibiotics for on farms. Okay, our next poll question. Does your dairy routinely use extra label antibiotics? And some of you may not yet understand what this means. Uh, I just wanted to ask this question before I gave you a definition, uh, just to see what you think. Do you think you use any extra label antibiotics or not? You, th you think, Jeff, this could be a, a Democrat Republican type thing? We're going to be polarized on this one, or uh, or not? I don't know. I my intent is not everybody knows exactly what the term extra label use means. Uh, so I think most all dairies probably do in some manner use extra label antibiotics, but I think m many of them don't really realize that they're using drugs in an extra label manner, which is why, see right now about 60% say yes and about 40% say no, and now we're going to talk about what that means. Uh, and I think some of the people that are voting no might realize that actually they are using antibiotics in an extra label manner. Okay. Okay, so before we go further, I want to define uh, a couple different things that we've mentioned already. So approved antibiotic use, this means using a drug that is specifically approved to treat a specific disease in dairy cattle at a specific dose and for a specific duration. Okay, anytime I deviate from that, it becomes extra label drug use. Okay, so if I'm using a drug that's approved for horses and not specifically dairy cattle or beef cattle, like Nuflor, Okay, that would be extra label drug use. But anytime I vary the dose on the label, which I think a lot of us do fairly frequently, that's extra label drug use. A good example is penicillin. Penicillin is a drug that's been labeled uh, for dairy cattle for 60 years or more. The label dose is still 3,000 units per pound. That's one mil per 100 pounds. How many people give their cow 12 cc's of penicillin? Almost no farms that I go to. Okay, so if you're given 30 or 40 mils of penicillin, which I think is an appropriate dose, that is now an extra label drug use. Okay, if we change frequency of administration, so if the label says give an intramammary drug once every 24 hours and you're using it every 12 hours after both milkings, that's extra label drug use. If you're using a drug for something other than what it says on the label, so Naxel is labeled or XNL is labeled for respiratory disease, if you use it for diarrhea, that becomes an extra label drug use. So I think extra label drug use is fairly common. I think it's necessary in some cases. It's just important to realize what is an approved use versus what is an extra label antibiotic use. Okay. There's also prohibited or illegal drug use. So there are some drugs, which we'll go through in a minute, that are illegal. You can't use them in an extra label manner, no matter how effective they might be. And those are usually drugs that have um, toxicity to some degree in humans. Okay, And I'll show you the list of what's prohibited in the next couple slides. Using a drug in an extra label manner without oversight from a veterinarian is illegal. Okay. So by definition, anytime we use drugs in an extra label manner on a dairy farm, on a beef operation, and any food animal, there has to be a veterinarian involved. That doesn't mean the veterinarian needs to give the drug, but we'll talk more about that in a couple slides about that relationship. Any antibiotic that would need to be fed to lactating dairy cattle is illegal. Uh, now, rumensin or ionophores are exempt from that. 
they're technically antibiotics, but they uh, don't fall under the same category, so those are certainly legal to feed. Um, but anything else for growth promotion or anything like that that we use in the beef industry is not legal in dairy cattle. And then use of compounded or homemade drugs used to be uh, intramammary products, homemade intramammary products were common. Uh, those are all now illegal or prohibited. So if you're using homemade drugs, uh, we probably ought to rethink that on farms. Um, the FDA takes a very negative opinion towards that now. Okay, so these are the injectable antibiotics approved for lactating cattle. The one is ampicillin, so that's polyflex. It is approved only for pneumonia. Okay, so I go to some dairies where they use polyflex as their antibiotic of choice for lots of different things. Um, and realize that's extra label drug use. It doesn't mean that polyflex isn't appropriate, but if you're using it for diarrhea, cow not milking well, anything like that, that becomes extra label. Ceftiofur, there's three different forms of Ceftiofur. There's Exceed, there's Naxel, there's Exonel. Um, they're labeled for pneumonia and foot rot. Only Exonel is specifically approved for metritis. Uh, erythromycin is an older drug. It's approved for pneumonia. Oxytetracycline, the LA200. Okay, we cannot use the, the Tetrador or the 300 mg per mil uh, formulations. Those are approved for beef cattle. They have an extremely long milk residue. So you want to make sure you're not getting the 300 mg per mil product and using it instead of the 200 milligrams per mil. That's actually, the oxytetracycline is probably approved for more things in the dairy industry than anything else. You can see it's it's got a long list of indications. And then penicillin, which we've already mentioned, uh, is one mil per hundred pounds. Uh, that's 3,000 units per pound. Uh, I use 10,000 units per pound as my starting dose. So you can see I'm well over three times the labeled dose, even with the lowest dose of penicillin I would consider using as a veterinarian. So I always use penicillin in an extra label manner. And then Albon is the last drug that's approved for lactating cattle. These, then we have lactating cow products. I don't need to go through this list. I just I just put this up here for completeness. Uh, and we have some dry cow products. But that is it. If you're using anything on your farm that's not specifically on one of these four slides in adult cows, okay, there are a couple other products that are labeled for calves. That's extra label drug use. So anytime you use a drug in a manner not specified on the label, you have to do a couple different things, okay. One, it's only allowed for FDA-approved animal drugs. I cannot use a human drug in an extra-label manner. So it has to be something that's on the market for cattle, for horses, sometimes even small animals. But I'm not allowed just to start using. Uh, there's a human drug out there we discovered worked against cryptosporidia, but it's not marketed for veterinary medicine. I can't just decide to use that drug on my calves because it works to kill crypto. Okay. Secondly, I have to have a veterinarian's involvement or the extra label drug use has to be under the instruction or guidance of a veterinarian. You have to have a valid client, veterinary client patient relationship and we'll talk about what that means. It must be for therapeutic use, means the animal's health is in danger. It has to be for a specific disease. I cannot use a drug in an extra label manner to improve milk production. Okay, or to improve growth or to make the heifers look nicer. It has to be to treat a valid disease. The animal's health has to be in danger. You can only use it for a disease where no other drug is approved in that species. Okay, so I can't just use Naxel to treat respiratory disease in my heifers because I think it works because there are drugs approved. Remember, Polyflex or Ampicillin is approved. Septifur is approved. If there are drugs specifically approved for a disease, you can't just choose something else because you think it works better. Okay, um, If you're going to use an extra label drug, you have to first use a drug that's approved for that species if possible. Okay, So if I want to choose something for diarrhea in adult cows, there's nothing approved to treat diarrhea in adult dairy cows. So first I have to consider the six drugs that I showed you on that list. Is there anything there that might work? Okay. A lot of people might use Ceftifur or Ampicillin. I can't just choose Batril or Nufor because those are not approved for dairy cows. I have to be able to establish an appropriate withdrawal time, both in meat and milk for that product, in order to use it in an extra label manner. 
Okay, let's take the case of Mycotil. Mycotil is a respiratory antibiotic approved for dairy cattle, or excuse me, beef cattle. So some people have tried to use it by the intramammary route to treat Staph aureus. Uh, we don't really have any information on what the milk withdrawal would be for doing that. Therefore, that becomes an illegal use of that antibiotic. Unless somebody can tell you what the appropriate withdrawal is, you're not allowed to use drugs in an extra label manner. Okay. When you use drugs extra labelly, we have to maintain records. We'll talk a little bit more about records later, and they have to be on file for a two-year period. So if the FDA knows that you bought a bottle of Nuflor on your dairy, that's not illegal, but it's extra label, they may ask you, show me the records of which animals got this and for what diseases, and you should be able to supply that information. And lastly, for all drugs, whether they're approved or not approved, you need to make sure you have labels on them. Okay. Label requirements, it should have the name and address of the veterinarian. This is NCSU, College of Veterinary Medicine, our address. Should have the brand name of the drug. Should have instructions for how it should be given. So the dose of the drug, the route of administration, frequency, whether it's twice a day, once a day, once every other day, and what the withdrawal time is for both meat and milk. Uh, if FDA or USDA come and inspect your farm, they're going to ask that. Okay. So extra label decision making. This is a decision tree, and I don't expect everybody to memorize this, but this just goes through uh, legal extra labeled use. So here are the animals to be treated for for food animals, for dairy, for beef. You would say yes. Okay. So we're looking for if we have a disease like respiratory disease, is there a drug labeled for food animals that would treat the animal? You would say yes. Okay. I gave you the example of diarrhea. Uh, no, there's nothing labeled for diarrhea, so no, we go down to the next level. Is there a drug approved um, for dairy cattle, let's say, that might work? And you might say yes, salmonella. Now, in some cases, uh, you could argue that there's drugs approved, but they're not clinically effective. A good example is calf diarrhea. Let's say I have a farm that has a salmonella problem. There are some drugs approved for salmonella in calves chlortetracycline, oxytetracycline, streptomycin, sulfamethazine, you can make an argument that none of those would be clinically effective for salmonella. So now I can say, uh, no, there's nothing approved for calf diarrhea that's going to be clinically effective, therefore I choose to use ceftiofur instead. Okay, so there's lots of areas where you can use extra label drugs in a legal manner. You just have to remember the requirements that we talked about in the last couple slides if you're going to do so. So this is a decision tree where you can sort of go through this and think about uh, is the extra label use of antibiotics on my farm legal or not legal, okay? These are the uh, prohibited drugs in the United States, um, and I see one question about using Batril, uh, which is a fluoroquinolone. Using Batril in anything other than a dairy calf is prohibited. So even though uh, the question asked, can we use it in India, we cannot use it in adult dairy cattle in this country. It's considered uh, a drug of very importance, very importance to humans, uh, and they're worried about resistance developing in humans. So we cannot use any fluoroquinolones in a lactating dairy cow. It is specifically approved for use in calves for treating pneumonia. So that's why it's got two stars. That would be a legal use of the drug, but anything other than that is illegal. Diperone is really not around anymore. That's kind of like banamine. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. You'll still find it in Canada some, and some of the, your older practitioners still have this around. Uh, that causes ulcers in humans, even with very small concentrations, so that's illegal. Metronidazole is a drug uh, that dogs and cats get for diarrhea quite frequently. Uh, that's illegal in food animals. Sulfonamides also has a star. Any like extra label use of sulfonamides in lactating dairy cattle is prohibited. The only drug, as you, we saw several slides ago, that is approved is Albon, which is sulfadimethoxine. You can legally use that in adult dairy cattle, but I cannot use any other type of sulfa. So the sustained boluses, the sulfamethazine, uh, or any other type of sulfa I, that I use in calves, I'm not allowed to use in adult dairy cows. Okay. Chloramphenicol, nitrofurazone, clenbuterol. Uh, phenobutazone is a fairly recent one. This is a drug that 
Uh, again, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that used to be fairly commonly used in lame cows. It was a pretty good pain reliever. Um, worked, I think, better than Banamine for lame cows. Um, but it is now prohibited. If they find any residue in dairy cattle, they're going to get really angry about that. And then glycopeptides. This is a family of antibiotics that would mainly include vancomycin. These are really expensive and nobody ever used them in dairy anyway. Uh, but again, they're prohibited because of their importance to humans. So make sure you're not using anything on this list ever in adult dairy cows. Okay, so back to veterinary client patient relationship. This is one of the big rules if you're working with extra label drugs. You need to make sure that you're working with a veterinarian to help understand appropriate drug use. This is a firm or strict requirement for extra label drug use. So the FDA gives a pretty strict definition of what they consider a valid veterinary client patient relationship. Uh, and this is their language, this is not mine. It says a veterinarian has assumed responsibility for making clinical judgment for animals on your farm and you have agreed to follow his recommendations. So basically that means he's been to the farm, he's familiar with your diseases, with the bugs you have on your farm, he's going to make treatment recommendations and you're going to follow them. Okay. Number two, he has sufficient knowledge to form a preliminary diagnosis and start treatment. So again, he is recently seen and recently is not defined, but in the dairy industry we think that means he has to have been there at least two to three times a year. Beef industry it may just be once a year, but he is recently seen and he's acquainted with the care of your animals. He makes timely visits to the premises where the animals are kept. So if you're getting your prescriptions from a veterinarian that never comes to your farm, has never been there, comes once a year, you probably do not have a veterinary, valid veterinary client patient relationship in the opinion of the FDA. Okay. Lastly, the veterinarian has to be readily available for follow-up. So if you're using a certain drug for respiratory disease under the orders of your veterinarian and all of a sudden it's not working anymore, you have to be able to get a hold of your veterinarian. He has to come out in a relatively short time frame and reassess and decide what you should do next. So again, he doesn't have to be there every day, uh, but if I work with some farms and the veterinarian that writes their prescription is several states away and rarely comes out, that's probably not an appropriate relationship. Uh, you should be able to have regular contact with your veterinarian. He should come to the farm on a regular basis. He should set up treatment protocols for you, uh, and you should be able to get a hold of him if something's not working. Okay. Next poll question, how many different employees on your farm might be responsible for administering drugs to cattle? Okay, if you're a very small farm, you may do everything yourself, only one. Is it two or three people, three to five, five to ten, or more than ten? Well, it looks Again. like we're really, we're really got them voting now, I tell you. I, uh, Jeff, you've got them scared, I'll tell you. They're zipping right along here, zipping right along. That's good. Maybe they're afraid so, of this Washington uh, carryover that happened last week. So, <laughs> so this is going to be, um, this is really going to reflect the size of the dairy. Certainly, as dairies get bigger, there's more and more people in charge of treating the animals. Uh, seems like two to three is the biggest category, about 62 percent. Okay, so when we talk about keys to responsible drug use, again, number one, have a valid veterinary client patient relationship, know your veterinarian, work with them. Number two, make sure your employees know how to properly administer drugs. Okay, if I look at drugs that are labeled for use in dairy cattle, there's a wide variety of administration routes that are approved. Some, like Albon Oral, there's drugs that are approved to use topically, there's a couple dewormers that go topically subcutaneous or under the skin, intramuscular, intravenous, intramammary, intrauterine, uh, and your staff, whoever's going to treat the cows, needs to be familiar with all of these. Okay, if you make a mistake, for example, banamine is labeled only for intravenous use. If I give it sub-Q, that dramatically changes the withdrawal time, okay, and that's going to increase my chance of having a residue violation. Another big thing that I think should is very important, this is one of sort of a soapbox for me, but make sure you have written protocols for treating common diseases on your farm 
that are set up with the help of your veterinarian. Okay. Again, many of our larger dairies have a significant number of employees that may be involved. Instead of them making the treatment decisions based on what they think, it works much better if you have a protocol that they can follow. That's going to maximize the likelihood that they're going to use the correct drug. That will maximize the likelihood that that cow is actually going to respond to the drug and get better. Uh, and that's going to minimize the chances of you having a residue violation. Lastly, make sure if you do set up protocols, they know how to follow it. Okay. Uh, some of our employees may have limited English skills. You may need to have uh, protocols available in Spanish. Um, to me, they should be very basic. They should be easy to follow. I like to use flow charts. That doesn't work well for everybody. If you're, uh, only one person is doing it, just a written set of instructions is fine. On these farms where more than 10 people are, are possibly treating the cows, I think simpler is better. Okay. I try to use triggers that are easy to identify. Cow has abnormal milk, cow breathing hard. And again, these need to be set up by your veterinarian for each farm. I don't think a treatment protocol should be something that you get out of a magazine and you post on your wall because what works for one dairy may not work very well for another one. Um, they need to be designed with by you and your veterinarian with your farm's goals in mind. Uh, use product names, so don't put Safety of Fure, put Naxel. Uh, people can always read the label. They can see what it says on the on the bottle. We don't put sulfadimethoxine. I would put Albon. And this is just an example of a protocol. This doesn't mean this is the protocol you should use on your farm for calf diarrhea. I'm just sort of giving you a visual of how I set up these flow charts. Just says calf has diarrhea, standing with suckle reflex, doesn't have a fever. We're going to give it two quarts of hydrolyte, which is an oral electrolyte solution call the vet if it doesn't get better. It does have a fever. We're going to give it the same oral electrolyte solution, and now we're going to give it an antibiotic and some banamine. Calf is not standing. Here we call the veterinarian. And again, you may have a farm where you're comfortable giving intravenous fluids, and the veterinarian's going to set that up over here. Uh, I have some farms where I'd rather them call me instead of try to give their own intravenous fluids. So these can be changed rapidly depending on what products you use on your farm, when do you want the veterinarian to get involved, etc. Um, so again, uh, I think you should have some sort of treatment protocol set up, not for every disease that you ever encounter, but for the common ones, okay? If you remember back to the beginning, we talked about cattle were most commonly treated with antibiotics for mastitis, reproductive diseases like metritis, lameness. Those are the diseases we need to have protocol set up for, okay? Unfortunately, the use of treatment protocols is not very widespread in our dairy industry. Uh, the Washington State Survey I talked about earlier, only 25% of dairy farms had written protocols. A uh, similar survey in Pennsylvania, only 21% of farms had written protocols. Only about 30% of farms sought veterinary advice on a regular basis before they started treating sick cattle. That doesn't mean they called the veterinarian every day. That meant uh, at least twice a year they would call the veterinarian and ask for help. So that's a very, very low percentage of farms that are really using a veterinarian on a regular basis. So uh, if you don't have treatment protocols, if you're not using a veterinarian uh, to help set those up for you, I would encourage you to, to do so. These are good friends of mine. This is Enrique and Gonzalo. They, are, they work for a large dairy. They are in charge of the fresh cow pen on a daily basis. They are good cow guys. They make their own treatment decisions. They follow no protocols. Some of the choices they use for therapy are approved drugs or very legal. Some of the choices they use for therapy are illegal. Okay. So if you look at their cart, they pull every morning. Uh, they've got all kinds of drugs in here. Some of them are on the prohibited list we talked about. Some of them are very illegal. If you open the other side here, there's more drugs in there. They've got fluids. Uh, they've got everything a veterinarian would need, but they're not following any protocol. These are non-veterinarians treating hundreds of cows on a daily basis. Okay, um, I think these guys do a great job, but this is not an example of what I would consider responsible drug use. Okay, I think we need a lot more oversight uh, on protocols from veterinarian input. Uh, these are, you know, they record sometimes on the clipboard. Uh, who got what, sometimes not, depending on how rust they get. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not uncommon on some of our larger dairies. Okay, we need to maintain good treatment records. 
The FDA, for one, as we mentioned, is going to require you to do so. They can ask to look at your treatment records for the past two years. They can also ask to look at all your drug purchase records for the last two years. You're supposed to keep a drug inventory. You should be able to say what happened to the drugs. So if I bought a case of Naxel, I should roughly be able to say what cows got treated with that Naxel. Okay? Account for all drug purchases or disposal. Treatment records are important. This is really the only way you're going to know who got what and when you can again sell the milk or that cow is eligible to be sold. If you're keeping a treatment record, it's got to have the date the drug was given, what kind of drug it was, the animal's ID, the dose you gave, the route of administration, and most importantly, who gave the drug. Okay, so this is an example. This is not necessarily the treatment records I need you to use on your farm. This is just an example of one. They don't have to be complicated. You could say Cal 5466 got treated on this day at this time uh, for mastitis in the right front quarter. We infused her with an intramammary antibiotic uh, and again the initials of who did it. You can keep track of uh, the milk withdrawal time, the meat withdrawal time, and you can use this for both intramammary or systemically administered drugs. Uh, but we need to measure uh, what we're using or keep record what we're using on some kind of treatment record on a farm. This is really important. Again, Pennsylvania survey we talked about earlier, about 50% of farms were keeping written records of antibiotic treatments. Okay? A lot of guys are just putting the leg bands on. They sort of try to remember when they gave penicillin, then they take the leg bands off. Uh, remember, leg bands can fall off. People can forget. Sometimes a different person worked that weekend and gave a treatment. There's lots of ways that that system can break down unless we're keeping some type of treatment record. A study in New York that looked at reasons why farms had residue violations, they found that the lack of treatment records was the most common reason for milk residues uh, in the state of New York. Number two, the most common reason was failure of the producer to understand how to administer drugs, so giving drugs by the wrong route. And then third, poor relationship between the producer and the veterinarian. So. These are all we've talked about. These are all really important reasons why people have residue problems. Five, make sure we store drugs, antibiotics uh, in a proper place, safe place. Make sure only appropriate people have access to them. You might want to consider keeping your extra label drugs separately from approved products. So if you do have a bottle of Nuflor, if you have a bottle of Micotil or something else that you use only on special occasion, or if you have Batril that you're using for the calves that get respiratory disease, uh, we probably want to make sure we keep that separately from what we're giving to the cows on a daily basis. Okay, Make sure we keep dry cow products separately from lactating cow products. Um, this is sort of the bare minimum that you have a lactating cow cabinet, a non-lactating cow cabinet. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing these be further apart. I wouldn't mind seeing there will be a lock on the non-lactating cow cabinet that only one or two people have the key. Again, using a dry cow intramammary product in a lactating cow is one of the more common reasons why we have milk residue violations. Uh, so definitely keeping your drugs separate, make sure only certain people have access to certain drugs is critical. Identify treated cattle. So leg bands, use a separate string, keep them separate from your milk cows. Some farms will use neck bands, colored chalk, uh, anything that works for your farm. But remember, these are a Band-Aid, okay? Um, these can fall off, leg bands can come off, colored chalk can wash off. The only thing that's going to help you 100% of the time is a good treatment record to remember who got what on what day and when their milk is safe to be sold, uh, when the cow can go to slaughter for coal. So these are a great idea, but they shouldn't be your only system for identifying a cow that got treated with antibiotics. Practice healthy herd management. This is important just in terms of decreasing the amount of antibiotics we have to use. Make sure you have good housing, nutrition, reproductive program. Uh, review your milking management program, hoof care, vaccination program with your veterinarian, if you're treating, you know, 25 to 35 percent of your cows on a regular basis, that's too much, okay? We need to do a better job with herd management. Sometimes disease prevention is more effective than disease treatment. We need to reduce the number of antibiotic treatments needed. So, again, this is far down the list. I certainly think we need to use antibiotics sometimes, um, but 
ma making sure we have a healthy herd and we have good preventative medicine programs in place are important as well. Remember mastitis was by far the most common reason we were using antibiotics so having a good milk quality program in place is important. The fewer cows we can treat for mastitis the less risk we are for having a violative residue. Drug screening tests are, are important, particularly if you're using extra-label drugs. There's a variety of these on the market. Uh, this is the Delvo test. This is the SNAP down here, uh, charm assays. Uh, screening test either for the individual cow or for the bulk tank. Um, there are several studies out there that show farms that use these are at a significantly reduced risk of having a residue violation. Um, these are really important. Um, I'll tell, tell you in a little bit about how to know which one to use for which drug. There's tables for that. Uh, but these are really, really good to use on occasion, particularly if you're using um, things like new floor that don't have um, specific with, withdrawal intervals. Again, you should be able to get that information through your veterinarian. Um, but if you use new floor for six days or if I used a big dose of penicillin for 10 days and I'm not really sure when she's going to go negative, I can always use one of these screening tests to make sure that the cow is clean. Okay. Consider culling chronic cows instead of just continuing, continuing to treat them for a prolonged time. Uh, a lot of these animals with long-term disease uh, are at the highest risk of residue violation. If you have a cow that's been treated for three or four weeks and is not responding, she's had five or six different antibiotics. Sometimes we might want to think about just euthanizing her instead of taking the risk of culling her. Uh, sometimes euthanasia is a better option and losing four or five hundred dollars and sending some of those cows to slaughter and risking a residue violation. And then complete quality assurance training. There's a good program in place. I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, it's sponsored by um, the Milk and Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Program. They put out these manuals every couple of years. Uh, right down this website, this is a very, very good website. You can download these manuals. These manuals are very valuable to producers. Uh, www.nationaldairyfarm.com residue slash prevention. Let me see. I had this bookmark. I don't know if it'll come up or not. No. Um, but on this website, you can download these manuals. These manuals are a great resource of information for dairy producers. You can also get sample forms. You can get treatment charts. You can get uh, some different disease treatment protocols. Again, I'm not sure we, could, we should use just a blank treatment protocol. I would encourage you to work with your veterinarian on that. But if you don't have any of the forms that I've talked about already, you can usually get very good examples off this website. So. They go through uh, a quality assurance program that's that's designed to be done with your veterinarian where he comes through and uh, reviews some of the things we've talked about already, make sure your drugs are labeled, make sure you have treatment protocols, uh, et cetera. But that's a voluntary program, um, but usually after you have at least one or two residue violations, they'll make you go through this on a ma mandatory basis. Okay, So make sure you write this. Uh, this uh, website URL down because this is a really, really good resource of information. You used to have to buy these manuals, but now you can actually download it free off the website. So there's lots of tables on approved drugs for uh, dairy cattle, both calves, which is a non-lactating cow and lactating cow, goes through everything that's approved, what the meat withholding time is for lactating cows, it's going to have the milk withholding time, uh, who makes it, what it's labeled for, how to use it appropriately. These charts are in there, milk screening tests. There's pages and pages of these. So this tells you what screening test you can use for what drug. So if I know I gave uh, the cow LA200 for a long time and I don't know if she's okay to go back in the tank or not, this tells me which test I can use to test her. Okay, I can use SNAP tetracycline. I can use these specific Delvo tests. So even for me, I can't keep all these tests straight. And this is a great resource for trying to figure out which one I should be using. Okay, it also has urine screening tests, so if you're looking at culling a cow that's been on a lot of antibiotics and you want to test her first to make sure she's going to get through, let's say she, she was on new floor um, and something else, I can look here and say this is the test I should be using for this particular drug. That will work on both blood and urine. So again, there's lots of other things. There's sample forms, et cetera, in these books, but these are a really good resource uh, for producers. Okay. 
The last 10 minutes here, I want to talk a little bit about residue testing. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about this lately in the, in the United States. There's certainly pressure from consumers and public health groups to limit the use of antibiotics in food animals. I think the more residues we have, the more this becomes an issue. There's also consumer demand for organic or antibiotic-free, both milk and meat. And again, uh, I'm not sure that's appropriate in the dairy industry as we have it today, but uh, I'm not going to say that there aren't some good organic farms out there. I think there's a perception among some people, in fact, I know there is. I've, I asked people in the grocery store that are buying organic milk why they're buying it. Uh, and some people will tell me they think it's a better quality product. Some people will tell me that the animals uh, are healthier, happier animals. And I'm not sure I believe either is true, but again, that's a discussion for another day. But I think the dairy industry needs to minimize the risk of drug residues uh, from a consumer perception standpoint. Milk is definitely one of the most heavily regulated products in the world. We need to protect consumers who may have allergies. Uh, antibiotic residues might also interfere with some of the manufacturing of milk products, for example, yogurt or cheese. Um, so I want to go through just in one slide how this happens. There is a federal act that assigns the food industry with the responsibility of ensuring the safety of milk. So it's really the food or the milk industry itself that has to police this. The FDA's role is to step in every once in a while and verify that the food industry or the milk industry is doing a good job. Milk quality in the U.S. is mainly con controlled by a group of people called the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance or the Grade A Milk Ordinance. So they assign responsibility for doing testing to individual states. The states assign responsibility to regulatory agencies in the state. The regulatory agency assigns responsibility to milk plants. Okay, so your milk plant does the testing, but ultimately the state checks on them, and then the feds, the FDA, checks on the state people to make sure they're doing an okay job. So it's very much a pass-the-buck type system. Screening tests must have FDA approval, which means they've been validated that they work. They can detect an antibiotic or another drug at a very specific concentration. For all approved drugs, there's what's called a tolerance level. That means there's an acceptable amount of drug that can be in milk or meat up to a certain level. So, for example, for penicillin, it's five parts per billion. You're allowed to have five parts per billion of penicillin in milk. You can have 50 parts per billion in meat. Okay. The other thing to realize is that for any extra-label drug, there's no tolerance. So anything that they detect is positive. If I use Nuflor on a farm and they detect even one part per billion, that becomes a residue because that was an extra-label drug use and it's not approved for dairy cattle. So we have to be a lot more careful with withdrawal times on extra-label drugs, specifically drugs that aren't approved for dairy cattle because they're going to look at a much lower concentration. Okay, last poll question. What's the most common, what do you think the most common drug that causes residue violations in both milk and meat in the United States is? Our choices are Ceftifur, again that's Naxel or Exanel or Exceed, Banamine, Penicillin, Oxytetracycline, or Albon, which is a sulfonamide. Looking at the voting here. 43% Penicillin. Yeah, they're coming in pretty yeah. well. Coming in. Okay. While you keep voting, I'll keep going. I'm running out of time here. Okay. So residue testing. A couple things to realize is the analytical techniques that their lab or the milk plant is using for measuring these drugs in milk and meat have improved tremendously. We can detect very, very, very small concentrations, uh, which is quite different than, say, 20 years ago. Okay. Again, the FDA is under pretty significant pressure to increase the frequency of testing. Currently, every milk sample of the United States is tested for beta-lactam antibiotics. Okay, so beta-lactam antibiotics is anything with what they call a beta-lactam ring. This would include penicillin, ampicillin, hedicillin, anything that ends in cillin, so penicillin, polyflex, which is ampicillin, or quite a few of the intramammary drugs or beta-lactams. This also includes ceftifur, the cephalosporins. They have a beta-lactam ring. So every tanker of milk in the U.S. is tested for beta-lactams. And then we randomly check for other types of antibiotics. Okay, So this is data on the number of tests that have been done for the last seven or eight years, uh, number of milk samples tested, 
number of positive tests. So if you average these all together, uh, we run at about 0.054% in terms of the number of tank loads of milk that have a residue violation. So that's one positive tank out of every 1,850 loads of milk. So very, very low in terms of the number of milk residue violations we actually have. Okay, A half of a half a percent. That's pretty low. We look at uh, what's causing residues. Again, penicillin is by far the number one. But also remember, every load of milk is being tested for penicillin. So we're looking for penicillin, except if you're much more than we're looking for the other types of antibiotics. Okay, So that doesn't mean we never look for Albon in milk, but if you look at for the last four years, almost 16 million tests for, for beta-lactams, less than 100,000 for anything else. Okay, So we're looking very, very frequently for penicillin, uh, except if you're ampicillin and things like that. Uh, we're looking much less frequently for the other types of drugs. Um, interestingly, if we, keep, we think of the U.S. as a pretty developed country, if we look at Europe, uh, you can see how stringent our program is in, here in the U.S. So again, we test every load of milk here in the U.S. The Euro European Union standard uh, is they test one sample out of every 15,000 tons with a minimum of 300 samples per year per country. So if you look at that uh, and compare it to the U.S., one sample per 15,000 tons is equal to about one sample per every 470 milk tankers. So you can see that we're testing milk much, much, much more frequently for residues here in the U.S. than any other country in the world. We look at data from the United Kingdom. Okay, This is from 2005 to 2009. They, did a, uh, they sampled 13,000 samples over a five-year period, and they found five residue violations. So that's not to say their program isn't acceptable, but they're testing much less frequently than we are here in the United States. Last, uh, t last year there was data available. This is for the whole European Union, about 50,000 samples tested. They found 102 residue violations. Uh, you can see their rate of residues is about four times higher than we have here in the United States. They're about 0.2%, and we were 0.05%. So uh, they don't look for residues near as often as we do here in the U.S. and actually find quite a bit more residues than we do. So uh, I don't mean that to disparage Europe at all. I just want to show you what a stringent testing program we have in place here in the United States. In terms of cold cow residues, which seems to be getting a lot of press lately, this is regulated by a different branch of the government. This is the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. They're collecting different tissues, muscle, liver, and kidney, most often at slaughter. There's two different ways they do this. One, they have a random program, and two, they have what's called an inspector-generated program. They can target sick cows, abnormal clinical signs in the cow, uh, if they see abnormal lesions in the cow, or they also will target certain farms that have a history of residue violation in the past. I'm running out of time, but uh, so this shows you the number of cold cows, this is dairy cows that are tested. Actually, between cold dairy cows and veal calves, they have the highest percent residues of any food animal, so more than beef, more than poultry, more than swine. So these are considered fairly high-risk animals. Uh, ultimately, we're testing about 3 to 4 percent of all cold cows for drug residues. You can see we average somewhere about 0.1 percent or 1.0 percent, so one out of 100 cows cold dairy cows has a residue violation. We're looking at what's causing the residue violations. Again, penicillin is number one, okay, ceftiofurifenixin, and then sulfonamides, Albon, is, is probably number two in terms of what causes residues in cold cows. Most common reasons for residue violations, not following directions for correct drug use, failure to follow appropriate meat milk withdrawal guidelines, not keeping treatment records, not identifying treated animals, extra label or illegal drug use. Uh, for specifically for milk residues, accidentally milking a treated cow into the bulk tank, um, milking a cow that has been dry treated instead of lactating cow treated, uh, not diverting the pipeline from the bulk tank before milking the treated cow. Sometimes people will forget to do that. Not following proper withdrawal times again or using an extra label treatment like 
five times the dose of penicillin without extending the withdrawal time an appropriate period. Okay. And again, just to close, these are some of the most common dairy residues, penicillin. Again, we're using a much higher dose than is approved typically. Uh, some people will use this by an inappropriate route, so they'll give it sub-Q or IM. Or we'll use benzathine, which is considered a long-acting, but it's really is more of a long residue penicillin instead of procaine penicillin. So again, penicillin, don't play games with penicillin. I think you realize they're testing for this every day, much more than any other drug. Okay, so we definitely don't want to cheat on penicillin. Seth, if yep, you're now, Jeff, yep. Uh, this is Lucas. Let's uh, let's get through these four questions in case people need to jump off at one o'clock, and we can come back to these. Is that all right? Yep. Tell me what my questions are. Uh, the first one I see is uh, so feeding Virginia mycin, which is also helquin helquinol. Is that extra label? And this is from someone in India. Yes, that would be extra label. It is approved in beef cows uh, in this country. It is not approved for dairy and would not it would actually be prohibited right now. And the next one is uh, on on the Batril. Yeah. Are gastric are gastric ulcers in humans also the reason for that prohibition? No, it uh, really has to do with the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. Fluoroquinolones are sort of the last line of defense for a couple of different pathogens in humans, uh, and they're really worried about um, increasing fluoroquinolone resistance, and that's the reason we can't use, um, that's the reason they're prohibited in food animals unless they're specifically indicated. And uh, the last one we have right now is how do you, how do you rate use of disinfectants like PHMG, et cetera, for prevention? And this I'm person not, has good experience with that molecule. Okay, I'm not specifically familiar with PHMG, um, but certainly the use of dis disinfectants in general, in terms of keeping your milking equipment clean, keeping the dairy clean is a good idea. Uh, I get involved with using disinfectants a lot in calves. Um, for trying to keep the environment clean for things like crypto we don't have an effective treatment so hygiene becomes really important I can't comment specifically on the one you ask about because I'm not as familiar with it but certainly use of disinfectants in general is a good idea keeping things clean um, but I think we're still going to need to use antibiotics some of the time and uh, can we go to the question slide at the end yeah I forgot to skip forward to that uh, we have a question here uh, also uh, that didn't come up on the line. What about the internet? Uh, does that establish a relationship of if if I'm on if I'm a veterinarian on your farm, can I once can I do everything by the internet after that as far as a veterinarian clientele relationship? They would prefer you do it over the phone. So so if you've been to the farm, uh, your veterinarian's been to your farm, he's seen your cows, and you have let's say diarrhea. Uh, I, I don't know that email won't work, but they would prefer that you call the vet and say, I have a case of diarrhea, and he says, okay, I don't need to see the cows. Go ahead and use this. I know what that is. Um, versus doing everything over the Internet. I'm not going to say the Internet uh, never works, but uh, phone and then the veterinarian actually being on the farm um, should take precedence over that. But the veterinarian has to be on the farm at some point. Is that correct? Correct. Cannot, and again, you know, there's not a specific number of you know days a year or whatnot that's that's specified. But most people would say at least twice a year he should be there. The other thing that's specified is he should be able he should be able to follow up if something goes wrong. If you give a cow a drug and they have a reaction, or if it's not um, if it's not appropriately um, if the animals don't respond, they should be able to come uh, within 24 hours. So again, if the vet's three states away, that's probably not valid. Another question came up here about uh, if my co-op is using charm test, does that see all the antibiotics uh, or just the beta-lactams, in other words? It depends uh, on which charm. There's several different charms. No charm is going to see everything, um, but there are several charms that see multiple antibiotics. And again, if you look at that list in the in the book I showed you, it'll tell you which charms see which things. Or Do you believe that in, that in the future, Jeff, that uh, uh, the the co-ops are going to have to be broader uh, broader in terms of their of their their looking for residues uh, to guarantee our public that uh, the milk is 100% wholesome? 
Yeah, I think we will see a greater number of, uh, again, you can't have a greater number of milk tankers tested for penicillin, but I think you'll see the other drugs tested for more and more commonly. Okay, sort of the last point I was going to make on this slide is, right now I saw a survey a while ago that the dairy industry and milk is, in general as a product has a very good perception amongst consumers in terms of it being a very wholesome product. And I think we need to do everything we can as an industry to make sure that it maintains that reputation. I think, you know, if things like drug residue get in the paper uh, and we people start thinking that's a public health concern, uh, I think we're going to go down. I think as long as people think that glass of milk is a very wholesome product, uh, is safe for them and their family, I think as an industry we'll be successful. Well, I, I think uh, uh, we'll let uh, uh, Lucas wind this up here. Lucas, you may want to mention the next two webinars that are uh, scheduled at this point, if, if we can bring those up here and, uh, and, and wrap up the formal part, Lucas. Yep. Uh, thanks, Mike. The next two are feeding for protein production, and that will be brought to you by uh, Chuck Schwab, and, and Mike will be back for both of these, of course, especially the October 10 webinar, which is precision feeding, and that's with Mr. Mike Hutchins himself from the University of Illinois. Uh, Jeff, I, I we want to thank you very much for all your time and effort. Uh, just a stimulating uh, uh, program here on a topic that will will probably be on our radar screen uh, uh, more and more as uh, consumers and food safety issues continue to be a, a prominent player here in the U.S. Uh, as we see um, meat recalls and lettuce recalls and all those things at this point. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Smith, we thank you for an enlightening hour at this point and. Uh, uh, Lucas, any final comments? Uh, no, I, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, the other questions, we'll, we'll try to answer them and get to them if they haven't been answered yet. Uh, otherwise, we appreciate you attending, and thanks again to Mary Ellen and their Best in Class Dairies program for the sponsorship. Well, let's go ahead and pick those off right now if you want to read those. If Jeff, if you've got a minute or two, okay. there's a couple more that yeah, come I, in here. One says, is the decision tree for extra label drug use avail available online? And it is. It's through the American Veterinary Medical Association website. If you go to avma.org, I think you can search and just put extra label drug use, but they've got a whole decision tree on there. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's where I took the figure that I used in this presentation. But it is online through the AVMA site. Uh, the last question says we have we consistently have cows that test for residue positive on the Delvo well beyond the withdrawal time listed on the package. Do you know what would cause that? Probably using uh, some of these tests are a little bit more sensitive than the tolerance. So if the tolerance is five parts per billion, sometimes they can detect much lower than that. We actually have more of a problem with the snap. The snap sometimes it takes forever for it to go negative. So I usually recommend using the SNAP more on the bulk tank more than an individual cow. Sometimes it will take that individual cow forever to go negative. Um, but sometimes if you're using a higher uh, dose or, or more frequent frequency, or sometimes the, it depends on the drug, the route of administration, um, you can see a prolonged withdrawal time. So I'm not sure if, if it's dose related or how you're giving the drug or if it's just uh, the Delvo, when I use it, works pretty well. Uh, if we could move back. Label today. Move back. Uh, thank you. I have one question here from the Hordes office. Uh, right. Representative Louise Slaughter, she's of the Buffalo, Rochester, New York area. She has been pushing forward for the FDA's ban on extra label cephalosporin. Yeah. What does that exactly mean, and what products are those, and, and what's the extra label part? Okay, so this is something that happened over a year ago now where they said there would be a ban on using cephalosporins in an extra label manner um, across all food animal species. So what that would mean is any cephalosporin, you couldn't use it other than what it's specifically labeled for. So that would affect things like Naxel. That would also affect um, things like today, which is cephapyrin, and that's a cephalosporin. So I can't use it for any diseases other than what it's labeled for. So it's labeled for respiratory disease, metritis, and foot rot. So if you're using Naxel for diarrhea, if you're using it in calves, if you use it in goats or anything like that, that would then be illegal. Okay? For cefepirin, if it says on the label uh, one dose at a, or two doses at 24-hour intervals, most people will continue their cefepirin until the cows 
free of mastitis of the milk's normal in color, that would then be illegal. You can only use it two times. So that would have a fairly profound effect on the dairy industry because we actually do use cephalosporins pretty routinely in an extra label manner. Um, there was a lot of backlash amongst veterinarians to that. There were several groups, including the bovine practitioners, that sent letters to the FDA that they didn't think that was appropriate. And they actually repealed that, so they took that away and said they would consider it more and it would, they would come back with a revised version later. My understanding is that it's coming sometime this year, not exactly a total ban on, um, like they had proposed on extra label use of cephalosporins, but some version of that is coming back. Okay? Uh, my understanding is they're really targeting the poultry industry who uses Naxel in every egg. Uh, to prevent some egg-borne diseases, so they consider that, again, a mass use of, of medication. They're worried about uh, resistance to cephalosporins becoming more widespread, um, but, you know, when they say there's no extra label use in the whole food animal industry, that's going to affect the dairy industry significantly. So I'm hoping they will limit it to third generation or fourth generation cephalosporins, which would be ceftiofur, but it would not be cefepirin or any of the intramammary drugs. But uh, I just don't know what's going to come back. There's going to be some version of that prohibition that comes back probably later this year or next. It's a long answer to your question. But. Yeah, thanks. It looks like we have uh, one more question. Uh, this, okay. this farmer has cows that consistently uh, test positive for residue on a double mini SP uh, well, beyond, well beyond the withdrawal time listed on the package. Do you know what would cause that? And this yeah. is using, using uh, today to the label. Yeah, I don't, I, I've, that was a question I was trying to answer before. I don't know what would cause that. Maybe it's, I use a double test fairly frequently and it's, it's fairly sensitive, but I wouldn't say it's overly sensitive. I'm not sure exactly what's causing that. Usually after the withdrawal time, that Delvo should be negative most of the time. Uh, one thing you could do is use it uh, on several cows together because certainly once you, if, if you have a very small concentration that in one cow, by the time you put it in the bulk tank, it's going to be diluted much, much further. Uh, so, you know, you could consider combining that cow with four or five or six other cows to see if it can be negative. Um, you know, and unless you're using that today on a more than 10 to 20 percent of your cows in your herd, by the time you've gotten beyond the 96 hour withdrawal time, the bulk tank should be negative. But I'm not sure I can tell you what's happening in that individual cow that's staying positive past the withdrawal time. Jeff, uh, what we probably should do is go back where you left off. Uh, Jim said, if you don't talk the PowerPoints, the few that you skipped, then they will not be on the recording. So if you want to go back and just okay. uh, highlight that uh, at this okay, point. Okay, so these we'll were at. just, uh, I had a list of six drugs that are some of the more common residue violations in the dairy industry. I talked about penicillin. The big one with Ceftifur is the different products, and they have different withdrawal times. You can see the exceed is 13 days versus three days. So some people mix up their product with the withdrawal time. Banamine, uh, the big thing about banamine is it's labeled for IV use, and a lot of people are giving it IM or sub-Q, which dramatically prolongs the withdrawal time. Nuflor and Mycotil, these are drugs I mentioned during the presentation. These are really beef cow drugs. They both have very sustained release. Uh, they have extended withdrawal times, and if we use these, either purpose, purposely or accidentally in a dairy cow, we can result in pretty long residue uh, violation or problems. Genomycin, I mentioned at the beginning, this has an 18-month withdrawal because it uh, reaches very, very high kidney concentrations. Um, so this is something that I would encourage you not to use in the dairy industry. Uh, but I showed you earlier about 15 to 20 percent of farms were still using this sometimes. This is an example of a drug that for certain diseases works very well. So if, you know, I showed you Enrique earlier, Enrique is going on by what works. The cows get better, but still not necessarily a responsible use of the antibiotics. And then lastly, sulfas. We mentioned that anything other than Albon and lactating cows was a prohibited use or illegal use. And sulfas notoriously are, uh, hang around for a long time. Uh, this is why these are one of the more common causes of residue violation in coal cows. 
Uh, I talked about FARAD. This is a program for your veterinarians that I'm involved with. Basically, if you use new floor or something on your farm, you're not sure what their withdrawal time can be, your veterinarian can call in and we can tell them what the appropriate withdrawal time should be. Uh, pretty much every pharmacokinetic study that gets published where they look at drug concentrations and how long they stick around, we keep that in a big computer database so we can pull that out and tell you. Um, this, unfortunately, this is not for producers because one of the requirements from the FDA is when there's extra label drug use that a veterinarian has to be involved, so they ask us to give this data uh, only to veterinarians, but your veterinarian can so just call your vet and say, hey, I used triple the dose of penicillin for 10 days. What do you think the withdrawal time should be? Uh, and he can send a, an email or call, and then we'll give him that information. Um, so those were the slides I didn't get through. Um, okay, very good. Well, Jeff, uh, thanks for your extra time and effort here today for just a dynamic uh, presentation. Uh, we thank Marielle also for their, their support. Without their support, obviously, uh, these webinars would have, uh, we wouldn't be able to bring them at this point. Uh, uh, Lucas, any final comments as we wrap up here? No, outstanding presentation, and, and uh, thanks again to Marielle. Yep, thank good. you. Have a good day. We stand thank adjourned. You.